my name is Brooke Medina. I'm the Vice President of Communications here at the John Locke Foundation, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have an important and sobering discussion. Today we're going to be talking about mental health and substance abuse. Homelessness and drug overdoses have been on the rise in recent years, touching both urban and rural parts of the state. In the backdrop, these problems are often mental health challenges. During COVID, many North Carolinians who might ordinarily receive regular treatment for severe mental illness fell behind on visits and prescriptions. Compounding these challenges is the fact that according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, there are only enough psychiatrists, psychologists, psychiatric nurses, addiction counselors, and mental health counselors to address 13.4% of the state's needs. Joining me today to discuss these challenges as well as potential solutions to the mental health and substance abuse problems across the state are Senator Jim Bergen, representing Harnett, Lee, and Sampson Counties, who also serves as the chairman of the Health and Human Services Appropriations Committee and the Health Care Committee, and John Locke Foundation Senior Legal Fellow John Guze, who has written and researched extensively on this topic. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. John, last year the John Locke Foundation published a report about mental illness and substance abuse. Can you share a little bit more about that? Well, this was uh, the last in a series of papers that we wrote about various kinds of problems that are uh, stifling economic opportunity in North Carolina. We, other topics that we covered included overregulation, criminal justice, the housing shortage. But of all of those, I don't think any is more important than mental illness and um, substance abuse because they have huge implications for uh, economic opportunity, not just for the people who suffer from these, but for other members of the community as well. Thank you. And Senator Bergen, in your experience uh, on these various health care committees, can you share a little bit more about what you've seen as the problem here across the state? Yeah, we have a huge problem. We have 31 counties that don't have a psychiatrist. And when you start looking at just services for folks, especially in rural North Carolina, um, they just don't exist. I was just in Cherokee last week visiting with the tribe and talking to them about the issues they have in their community where over 40 percent of the folks there have a mental health or substance abuse problem. So, um, you know, when I look at the John Locke Foundation and I think of all the things you all are involved in and the concerns you all have for people and, and people in business and workers, we have a lot of folks that cannot work right now because of their mental health, and um, uh, drug issues. So I think it's probably the, the number one um, impediment to good business in North Carolina. Let's actually explore that a little bit. There is that uh, impediment to economic opportunity and just the, the first, second, and third order of effects that happen as a result of not getting the health care that is necessary. Uh, can you speak a little bit more to that economic opportunity? Sure, so I think the effects on the sufferers is pretty obvious. Uh, a lot of people with severe mental illness or substance addiction, they just can't or are unable to work altogether. So of course their economic opportunities are curtailed, but I don't think people realize the extent to which it has uh, uh, impacts that, that dissipate into the whole community because for one thing, uh, people with severe mental illness and drug addicts commit more crimes, including some dreadful crimes. We've seen a lot of that lately than other people. That's a burden. Um, but even more so, because so many of them end up homeless, they congregate in public spaces in disruptive ways. And the rising crime combined with the breakdown of law and order, it, it drives away businesses. It, it discourages investment. The result is low, higher levels of unemployment and fewer economic opportunities for everybody. What are you seeing in particular in the counties that you're representing? Are there particular examples that come to mind? Yeah, there are. There's uh, the impact in, in the, the medical community. On any given day in North Carolina, there's about 375 people that are in emergency rooms that are either for, for behavioral health or involuntary commitments. Usually over 50 of those are children. So you look at all of that and the impact that that has, not only in the community, but to those families, Plus, they we're taking up space in the emergency room for other people that can't get in the emergency room. So we're really we're warehousing people at a very expensive hotel because we haven't set aside enough resources to deal with them and the mental health issues they have. Yeah, John, that actually reminds me of just uh, some, some work that you've done on the history of mental health care here in North Carolina as well as the U.S. overall. Can you just give us some background? Sure. So. It used to be, you know, as recently as the 1950s, hundreds of thousands of Americans were 
pretty much permanently living in state asylums. We had a well-intentioned but ultimately misguided movement to uh, deinstitutionalize these people in the 60s, and the result was that there's almost nobody left in, in state asylums anymore. Um, if they had been able to place those people in, ideally in, in group homes with um, good public health support and the opportunity to spend their days in um, rewarding clubhouses and so on, this might have been all right. But instead, what's happened is an awful lot of those people are just living on the streets. Um, or, and far too many of them are actually incarcerated in prisons and jails. Uh, it's, it's not ideal for them, it's terrible for them. In fact, that it's bad for the rest of us too. It's expensive and it's, uh, uh, as I said, it has sort of knock-on effects on, on the communities in which these people live that diminish economic opportunity for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, I believed from what I know about the history is there was pushback and the pushback against like the institutionalization and now that is there is a resurgence in that conversation. I've heard it from, I think even the New York mayor had mentioned, uh, you know, institutionalizing folks. And so uh, how do you, how do you navigate this very difficult conversation about that sort of topic and balancing that with the, the belief in the worth and dignity of hu each person? Like, it seems like there's tensions, but how do you navigate it? Because I think it is possible to. Well, I think, I think there were a lot of good intentions. I think the intent was get people out of institution, get them back in their community and provide services. We did the first two, we didn't do the last one. We never provided the services. Um, I've, I've had multiple conversations with uh, Governor Pat McCrory. He, his second administration, he had a big package of mental health issues that he was going to implement. I actually have that package and have gone over it with him and with current Secretary Cody Kinsley. Uh, just last week and then even this morning, I texted with former Governor Mike Easley because he um, worked on a lot of mental health issues. So I've been trying to look back to see what was talked about, what was planned, but what we didn't get implemented. Because I think that if we go back and, and figure out how to, how to either get those services in the community or take the folks that have the biggest need and put them in a facility that where we can treat them. Because at the end of the day, putting somebody somewhere and keeping them there is not a good long-term solution. There's a lot of good evidence now that long-term injectables uh, really help people and let them uh, be able to function in their home, in their community, keep a job. Um, so that's what we're working on now. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of those services, I mean, how would you, if someone maybe isn't as familiar with the mental health part of the, the North Carolina health care systems, uh, what kind of services are those? What do they look like? There's a lot of services, but the big problem is nobody knows. I get calls every week from folks telling me about a particular situation that's going on in their family or with a loved one. And you know why they call? Because they don't know what to do. Now there is a number, 988, that is a new number that we established last year for folks that are in crisis, whether it's a mental health crisis, they're contemplating suicide, any of those, and I encourage people to call that number. And, and I have called that number and actually asked them questions to see how everything would work, and, and, and it does work. Uh, we have a call center outside of Greenville that, that, that a lot of those calls go to. So I would encourage people to do that. But we all need to be, be talking about where to go. The first stop shouldn't be the emergency room, but that's where a lot of these folks end up because when there's a crisis, nobody knows what to do. They call 911, the police show up, they arrest these folks, they're then involuntarily committed, and then the process starts. And it is not a good process because once you're in that system, you have to progress. I've had folks that, I had a, a family that had a 16-year-old daughter that tried to kill herself. Uh, she ended up being committed. They could not, even though I, I was help, able to help them find a facility in Raleigh to bring her to, she was in Charlotte, mm -hmm. Um, they couldn't just bring her. They, the police had to actually transport her and it was just a process. So someone that had been in a terrible situation, held for eight days with no treatment or anything, and then gets handcuffed, put in a police car to be brought to Raleigh is not a system that's mm -hmm. very friendly to the public. No, can you speak to that? Yeah, I can, I can speak from personal experience that this is exactly what happens. It happened to our family. We have a grown daughter with schizophrenia. When she had her psychotic break, what, she was in college in, in uh, Washington State. And that's often the case. If you've got loved ones who are heading off to college, I say, 
stay in touch with them and follow what's going on because that's when these things very often happen. But there's all kinds of problems we had to, we had to contend with. One was the uh, federal regulations regarding how you can communicate with places like universities about your children. They wouldn't tell us anything about what was going on, even though we knew things were very wrong, until eventually they said, you gotta come and get her, because she's out of control. But by the time that happened, she'd already been arrested. It took us a month, four weeks, to get her back into North Carolina from Washington State. And um, once we got her back here, we got her into treatment, but still, she cycled in and out of mental institutions, brief stays, they keep them for two weeks, and they release them. And it wasn't until she started a fire in our house and got severely burned and ended up in the burn unit at UNC that we finally got her committed for a long term at um, the um, uh, Central Regional Hospital in Butner. And I have to say, from that point on, the services we've received have been excellent. Everybody at Central Regional Hospital was wonderful, and the social worker there was wonderful and helped us find a group home and a clubhouse for her to go to during the day. And Things are much, much better now, but it's just so hard to negotiate that system. And we were lucky, firstly, because we were in Raleigh and North, uh, Durham, we're in the Triangle area where these kinds of services were available, and we had, we were able to negotiate the system. These, these, correct me if I'm wrong, Senator, but I don't think these kind of facilities and services are even available in most of the rural parts of the state. They're not, and, and that's the problem is, it, it, not only that, but all of our mental health hospitals are completely full now, or we don't have the staff to open the beds that we have available. Huh. I want to be at Central either next week or week after that. I'm going to visit a 10-year-old ch child that I met at a psychiatric residential treatment facility, and I'm trying to follow his progress because we have a group of children that if we don't deal with them while they're young, uh, they're going to age out of our system and be on the street or incarcerated. And, and what I've found uh, working on mental health and health care is that just like any other disease, the earlier you intervene, uh, the better it'll be. Just think about the four months you lost with your daughter. That, that's, that if, if you could have intervened early on in that, it could have changed her whole trajectory. Well, that's what the psychiatrist involved told us, but we couldn't convince the uh, district attorney and for that matter, Chloe's lawyer out in Washington State that they needed to move things faster or maybe they just that's just as fast as the legal process can work, I don't know. I think what that highlights, and thank you for sharing that, John, but that highlights just, I mean, the real just painful, challenging nature of this topic, because it's affecting real people and uh, families, and as a parent, of course, especially, I think we're all parents here, it's just your, your heart is to help your child, and I'm sure there are people watching who also feel that way. And, um, and so, first off, though, if you do need help or there is someone in your life that does, they can call 988 yes, for services. But also, there, this is part of the bigger problem of, uh, of what John just highlighted, which is all of, these, um, all of these systems and processes that need to be amended and updated and uh, make it more seamless for people to get the help they need. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about mental health, a big component of it, or at least there is some crossover, seems to be substance abuse. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about that, please? Sure, so there's, there's a, there's a, it's a real nexus. You, the fact is most people who, well, I, don't think most, I think most people who are, are, are addicted are also mentally ill, and certainly a very high percentage of the people who are mentally ill end up addicted. Um, there's a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is they're sort of self-medicating. Um, there's also a growing body of evidence that suggests that using uh, extensive use of pot can trigger a psychotic episode or even full-blown schizophrenia. I think, frankly, that's what happened to my daughter. Um, and, but there's also the fact that um, once people become mentally ill and substance abuse, those are the people who end up on the street. And, and that has all the knock-on effects I talked about earlier that affects the whole community. You're really smart because everything you said is exactly right. Everywhere I travel in the state and as I travel to other states, I hear the same thing. I talk to emergency room doctors all the time. They estimate 75 to 80 percent of the folks that show up uh, have mental health issue and they're, they're, they're self-medicating. So if one of the big drug issues that we have in this country could be resolved if we would deal with the underlying mental health issues. And, and if, if we ever 
figure this formula out, I think we can solve a couple of big problems that, that we're facing as a nation. We're talking about solving these problems. Can you gentlemen give us some some actual steps to what you're what you're working on at the legislature and what you're seeing the research proves is is effective? Uh, Medicaid expansion is one of the tools, and, and uh, I was always against Medicaid expansion because we already have roughly three million people that are on Medicaid. We're going to go to about 3.6. When we do that, one-third of the total population of North Carolina is going to be on Medicaid. I don't think that's a good long-term solution. But by expanding Medicaid and getting people treatment so that we can get them into long-term treatments, and I'm not a bit, I, I think 30 day treatments are not good for folks. I think that just kind of is a revolving door. I, I think that we, you need to commit a year or two years to somebody to help them get through a journey of, of use and, and abuse of drugs and the mental health component. Uh, there's programs like TROSA. I was just recently up there with them, which is a two-year program. They have about 500 people that are in that program. I was at another facility called October Road in Asheville. It's got a thousand people that are in drug treatment right now. <laughs> and those are just, <clears throat> excuse me, two of the facilities across the state. There's a lot of people that are quietly doing a lot of good work. Medicaid expansion will generate about a billion and a half dollars of money that we can spend. I've asked the governor and other folks to commit a billion of that to be put in a trust for mental health so that we develop a comprehensive plan on how we're going to deal with mental health. I don't want us to waste a penny of that money. Well, I would, I would certainly agree with all that. And I would also add that um, we might have to make some changes to the civil commitment laws. Yes, sir. Um, we need to make it easier. I mean, North Carolina is much better than many states on this. I, I again, speak from personal experience. Um, magistrates and judges in North Carolina are usually pretty reasonable about this when it has to happen. But I still think we need to change the standards so that imminent harm isn't what's required before somebody can be involuntarily committed. If somebody clearly cannot care for themselves, cannot work, they cannot house themselves, they can't provide uh, food and clothing, that ought to be regarded as evidence of being uh, a danger to themselves and it ought to be possible. We need good due process protections, but it ought to be possible to get somebody committed without waiting for something terrible to happen as, what, as it was the case with our family when there's a fire and somebody's injured. And when the call goes in, when someone does have a problem, we need to have the right people show up. Just having the police show up is not, it's, it's a disservice to the police, even though we're training more and more of them on how to deal with mental health issues. You know, in a perfect world, I would think we would have people that would show up, deal with those folks, never take them to the emergency room, take them straight to a facility that can start treatment immediately, whether it's getting them on, on a medication or teaching them additional coping skills and other things, but, but one of the things we've got to do is we've got to start with kids. We have got young children that are institutionalized right now. I had a young man in one of the local hospitals in Harnett County, seven years old, he was there 119 days in the emergency room. Now you're a mom, take one of your children and picture them being in a facility with, and I don't mean in a room, I mean in a glass facility in the ED that the only people they're seeing are the nurses and the doctors and the only time they could take him outside was when the helicopter was gone because they had to keep him in a fenced area. And uh, that's, that's not what we need to be doing as North Carolinians. No, no not at all. Um, Can I add one more thing about that? I, again, I have to give out a shout out to the Durham police with whom we dealt more than one time. But they've, at, even back then, they had gotten some crisis intervention yes, training and they were very good. <laughs> We are, we are asking a lot of our law enforcement, though, in these contexts, it sounds like, and then asking a lot of those who are receiving the services, this, this child, the seven-year-old and his family. Uh, and so it's clear there do need to be reforms made, uh, but obviously, as with anything, especially in a sensitive topic like the healthcare space, but what are some of the rebuttals or the challenges that folks have been have been lifting up that have made it difficult to implement these? Well, it's expensive, you know, and, and it seems like it always comes down, especially uh, when you're a politician and you're in Raleigh, it comes down to money. And, and we don't have a budget right now, and we need to get a budget. We, 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 we just adjourned, and we're not going to be back in session for probably two weeks or so. So in the meantime, a lot of things are going to change July 1st. A lot of the rates change of the people that we pay to take care of the 
those fragile people, those the pay, what we pay them, those rates are going to go down. So we're going to impact people that have are, are not on the highest pay scale in our state, that are uh, providing very necessary services to loved ones that can't take care of themselves, and something's going to happen. I, I warned my caucus and and the members that, uh, yesterday, and again, <clears throat> excuse me, today we talked about it that that they're going to start getting calls because some of these facilities, if they don't have people, they're going to have to, to take those patients and put them in either uh, emergency rooms or call people and say, you need to come get your loved one. And that's very concerning to me. Well, I agree with that. Um, it's, it's going to cost some money. Hopefully in this Medicaid expansion, we'll cover some of it. But even so, I think it's going to be money well spent. And because emergency rooms are incredibly expensive, um, Police and prisons and jails are expensive. I think if we start handling this better, there'll be some savings, and that might offset some of the, a lot of the costs. And, and additionally, the crime, the economic impact by driving away business and investment, there'll be benefits that will offset, will more than offset the cost, I'm pretty sure, in the long run. I haven't run the numbers, but that's my belief. I think that's an important aspect of this as well as that holistic look where it's not just the individual, even though that's exceedingly important, but also the, the safety of the community, the efficiencies uh, that can be developed within the emergency departments and in the uh, putting police on, uh, on their actual job and creating better space for folks to uh, have trained professionals help with those who are in crisis. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. It's a sobering topic, uh, but it's a necessary one. And so you can learn more about the study that we've just released at the John Locke Foundation if you go to johnlock.org slash mental health. And uh, we appreciate your time. And please, again, leave a comment if you have any questions. We thank you for tuning in. Have a good day. <music>